of a shrouded isle lies a cave so deep where the dark waters flow and deep in the cave lies a hoard of gold the treasures of all On a stormy night, you can hear the cry of the fearsome beast. God's the goal, he's taken the life of many as a man. Both fool and brave say the tale is all. To carry his pipes through the darkening paths takes a viper of nerve and courage to play. Young Piper MacArthur now was such a man, he paid to soothe the soul of the waves to find his fortune. He blew his pipes and trusting to God he entered the caves I returned from the caves of gold I returned from the caves of gold Turned his fingers to As you gaze out to sea from the northern cliffs, 
think of this tale and the caves below. For Piper MacArthur lies there with the gold. On the cry of the waves, hear his distant echo. Staggering folks will be swift horses. I return from the caves of old. The squabbling boys will be men of strength. of the night or will be turned to stone. Light of owl gliding low, silent wings, white feathers glow, catching my light, startling sight. Go 
Ghostly starlights, distant bright, lights the secret of the night, burning afar, there you the sun without a sound, walking there on friendly earth, I can sense the universe. trees I'll watch the sun climbing high the day's begun morning breeze singing leaves ancient trees I'll drink the sun growing tall the day's begun morning breeze singing Without a sound, walking there on friendly earth, I can sense the universe. Forest plays upon the ground, watch the sun without a sound, walking there on friendly earth, I can sense the universe. There's a hush in the darkness. The peace that you feel is the breath of the earth. Catch the echo, the crisp taste, the flakes falling on your tongue. Your walk beside me is more than I deserve. More than I.
Shrouded isle lies a cave so deep where the dark waters flow, and deep in the cave lies a hoard of gold, the treasures of warlords long ago. On a stormy night, you can hear the cry of the the gold he's taken the life of many as a man both fool and brave say the tales of all I return from the caves of Turned from the caves of gold. A story is told how the beast can be tamed by a piper's lament. Hello everyone, we're going to be starting in about five minutes, so you've got five minutes to get a drink, and there's a few seats at the front, so don't be afraid to come, we'll start in five. Young Piper MacArthur now was such a wee man. He paid too soon the soul of the waves to find his fortune. He blew his pipes and trusting to God, he entered the Flow turned his fingers to
As you gaze out to sea from the northern cliffs, think of this tale and the caves below. For Piper MacArthur lies there with the gold on the cry of the waves, hear his distant echo. Go 
ghostly starlights, distant brights, lights the secret of the night, burning afar, there you the sun without a sound, walking there on friendly earth, I can sense the universe. Hello everybody. Merry festive season to you all. And welcome to Shoreline 1000, no, Event Horizon 1074. I'm not actually sure what number we're on. It's in the 70s, and I think towards the 80s now, we've lost count. But uh, at some point, we'll have to celebrate the centenary, won't we? But um, welcome to Event Horizon. For those of you who haven't been, it's a night of science fiction entertainment. Uh, which runs here about three or four times a year. Um, and it's the last of 2022, so we're giving a big finger to 2022. <laughs> uh, but also, we're launching a new issue of Shoreline Infinity, which is a science fiction magazine, if you're unaware. It includes lots of poetry and stories and artwork and book reviews and nonfiction and the science fiction genre. You can see a copy of the new issue right here. Ooh, very nice and shiny. And uh, perhaps even more importantly, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's kind of a sad day too because we'll be saying farewell to our founders who are Mark and Noel, um, which is obviously a very sad thing. We're gonna hear from them later and um, say a few words on that too. Um, and I also want to point out that we are live streaming, thankfully. So if you want to avoid appearing on the internet, then just avoid that camera over there. Hello, everyone online. Oh, and that camera over there, too. <laughs> and there's, there's a, a drone. That <laughs> no. um, but with, the, uh, with Noel and Mark kind of uh, moving on sl somewhat, we do have uh, new team members and existing team members who are still going to be doing all this sci-fi stuff. Um, and I won't say a lot about them because you're going to see some of them tonight and hear some of them tonight. So uh, I will explain, though, what the team consists of. So there's me, who's continuing to do poetry. Thank you. Uh, we also have Eris, who's uh, taking up fiction. And next to Eris, we have Pippa, who is running the nonfiction. On our merch table, some, some of the team members too, we have James, who is the production editor. <laughs> James is relatively new, but already doing a great job. And uh, Yasmin, who is our publicity and marketing editor. <laughs> we also have another team member who, unfortunately, isn't here because she was offered free booze and food. <laughs> um, who can blame her? Um, it's Anne who runs the reviews and is also kind of overlord of the rest of us. So let, let's put our hands together for Anne too, who's not here. You may have noticed there were some songs playing just now. Um, and I'm going to tell you about those in a little bit. But of course we have the raffle, right? So I'm going to show you the first raffle bag. Has everyone got a raffle ticket? If you don't have a raffle ticket, you will get one for free, so you can ask for it. But also, if you buy anything from the Shoreline shop, you get another raffle ticket. So you're increasing your odds to win these amazing, amazing prizes. <laughs> so the first bag is a Christmas bag. What do we have? Well, on my way here, I decapitated Rudolph the reindeer so that you could wear his antlers. I've also... He did, I know. Come on, he's such a show-off. And a mug that's in the shape of a Christmas pudding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer DVD. <laughs> An elf lollipop. 
I'm wondering if this is the lollipop from uh, the Santa Claus movies, you know, that makes you fly. I think it might be. <laughs> and lastly, and I'm sure this is in high demand, especially after you've heard the, some of the gags tonight, we've got a Christmas joke book. It, it's sexist because it says Christmas jokes for funny blokes, but if you can ignore the sexism, great fun. That's the Christmas bag. Yay. Yay. You will have heard some music playing. So during the breaks, you're actually going to hear more of that. And that is Painted Ocean. Now, for those of you who came to Shoreline Finch's Event Horizon way back, you'll remember Painted Ocean because they played eight times in the past <laughs> until the point I banned them from playing again. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about them, though, because you, you may not know about them. Painted Ocean have been a fixture at Shore Infinity's Event Horizons, having performed in person or via the interdimensional music box no less than eight times, establishing the tone of our events and leading the way in making sure that music became an integral part of our over-70 Event Horizons to date. Uh, patent, uh, Painted Ocean is made of Mark Toner, Shoreline's Arts Director, and Noel Chidwick, yes... Shoreline's editor-in-chief, and their music has been described, I think by them, as progressive folk rock with a touch of the psychedelic about it. That was Painted Ocean. And before I introduce our first um, speaker tonight, I am actually going to show you Raffle Bag 2, because I'm not hosting all of tonight, we're, we're introducing each other, but I need to do the raffle stuff, so we're getting it out of the way. So Raffle Bag number two. Oh well, no, yeah, oh, it's a biggie. The, the actual gifts aren't that big. <laughs> Obviously, um, Santa Claus died for all our sins at this time of year. <laughs> That's accurate. Um, so, saving Santa DVD. We've also got a chocolate Santa. Yeah. Yes. Eat of the body of Santa. Um, some magic snow. Yeah. <laughs> There's only half a gram of it. <laughs> and a Santa hat. Yes. I think that imbues you with the powers of Santa, as in the Santa Claus. Yep. And some Christmas stickers. Yeah. And this is a big one. Uh, a Santa mug. And I know some juggling puddings. Yeah. All of that could be yours tonight. Okay, we'll leave the third bag for the later. But um okay, let's get on with it, right? So the joke. What did the wise men say after they offered up their gifts of gold and frankincense? Wait, there's myrrh. <laughs> Thank you. I think that one's quite clever, personally. <laughs> okay, so our first um, speaker tonight is Eris Young. Eris writes and edits speculative fiction. They are the fiction editor at Shoreline of Infinity, and their short stories have appeared in magazines such as Pseudopod, Fusion Fragment, Escape Pod, and Metastella. Their story, All That Water, came first place in the 2021 British Fantasy Society short story competition. In 2022, they received a Scottish Book Trust New Writer Award. So please welcome Eris Young. <laughs> everybody. Um, thanks, Russell. That was really nice. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. You all know me, I guess. Uh, you've probably seen me up here as a speaker. Um, I've got my editor hat on today, so I'm not reading my own work. Um, instead, I'm going to say a few words about our new issue. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce uh, and talk a little bit about our flash fiction competition from this year. Um, so it's very exciting stuff. Uh, so this new issue, this is like sort of um, well, it's one of the first issues that I was, uh, you know, had the privilege of, of putting together um, with Noel's help. 
um, as fiction editor. Um, and I just, you know, this whole year I've been humbled and privileged to work uh, with Noel and Mark um, and the whole team uh, to put together such a gorgeous magazine. Um, so we have some amazing fiction in here um, from some people who are in this room this very evening, though I can't see any of them because I can't see anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've got some quite bleak stories, some dystopian stories, and some also uplifting and hopeful stories. Uh, there's far future space opera, there's utopian sci-fi, there's um, near future contemplative stuff. So I uh, highly recommend you give it a read. And that's just the fiction. There's also poetry, nonfiction, uh, interviews, book reviews, um, and some gorgeous illustrations. Uh, so I highly recommend you pick up an issue, uh, a copy of issue 33. So uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, let me get this. Yeah. Uh, so this year we had, a, well, we've got our annual flash fiction competition. Uh, the theme this year was My Pet. Uh, this was uh, judged by, uh, so it's science fiction flash stories, uh, 1,000 words or less? It was 1,000, right? 1,000 words or less? Yeah, a thousand words or less, uh, judged by Edinburgh University students. Um, and, huh? oh, it was Napier. This is, this is University of Edinburgh. Uh, it's his fault. It's his fault. Uh, it was Napier. Yeah, god damn it. Uh, this is, th these are the hands that you're leaving me a magazine in. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, some uh, incredible Napier students. Uh, read and judged the stories. Uh, we've got three winners here, uh, two runners up and one uh, big winner. So um, the results are uh, the runner up uh, is, first runner up is The Tan One by Nathan Sesnick. Uh, our other first runner up, they're not ranked, uh, is Omnipet by Dom Barlow. And our overall winner of the 2022 uh, Shoreline of Infinity Flash Fiction Competition is I Know How This Ends by Jesse Rowell. <laughs> Which is a beautiful story. Um, so I'll just read the judge's report. Uh, and uh, the three stories are all published uh, within the issue of the magazine. So I'll say a few words about those stories. Um, and this is the sort of judge's report. While all the submissions this year were fantastic pieces of writing, there were a number which had a unique effect with the judges. Of those, picking a finalist was extraordinarily difficult. And I sat in on that judging meeting and it was like a Eurovision style head-to-head -head competition. It was really thrilling. All of the stories displayed a wonderful array of themes. Many were emotional and some were hilarious, but all were poignant. Each writer displayed fantastic technical ability, wit, and dedication to their craft. Picking a winner of the competition came through much debate, arguing, and table throwing, but eventually, I Know How This Ends emerge, uh, emerged displaying an excellent thematic architecture through its hermit crab-based metaphor, analyzing the state of humanity and its current or futuristic dwellings, this piece is one that will stay with the judges. Its poignant take on the, hum on the humanity of space explorer and introverted techie tropes were excellent twists on sci-fi fiction conventions, giving its reader food for thought for many moons to come. Um, so you will be able to read that fantastic story uh, uh, in the issue there for sale at the table just over there. Um, and uh, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, Debbie Cannon, who will be reading, uh, are you going to read the entire uh, winner? That's great. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it read aloud. Um, I have been instructed to tell a joke. Uh, <laughs> picture me with a gun to my head. Uh, where do Sith go shopping for Christmas presents? At the Darth Mall. I heard someone sadly say the answer to the joke. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And now, reading the winning story uh, will be Debbie Cannon. Debbie is a writer and actor and one of Playwrights Studio Scotland's mentored playwrights for 2022. Very nice. 
Uh, she has written and performed two one-woman shows, the award-winning Green Knight and The Remarkable Deliverance of Alice Thornton. Career highlights include seeing stars with rock superstars Painted Ocean. Uh, she is also a Mark Toner and Noel Chidwick super fan. <laughs> Please welcome Debbie Cannon. I Know How This Ends by Jesse Rowell. I gift my pets the illusion of free will by placing new shells, 3D printed with silica paste, inside their terrarium. Controlled by pheromones, the hermit crabs alert each other to new and abandoned shells and start transferring homes. Their tails look soft and vulnerable as they scuttle under the artificial light of heat lamps. A hermit crab cowers in her shell as a male taps his shell against hers, tap, 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 before ripping her out. She crawls into a corner to die. She would have had more options to survive in an ocean light years away. I watch the male curl into the contours of her shell and I wonder what it feels like to slide into someone else's home. From the confines of our rocket ship, we follow each other out of the door. Our bodies atrophied from decades in space our skin soft under the light of a new star. There are not many of us left. My hermit crabs have outlived most of my crewmates. Get rid of them, they tell me. There are no resources here for your pets. I scan the dust of this planet and shake my head. They will die outside. I hold the crab who lost her shell and feel the pleasant pinch of her claws against the palm of my hand. There is something beautiful and alien about her, a living jewel. Her black eyes pivot as she watches me. The wind moves the hair like seti on her legs. Throw that away, pal. You need to deploy the builders. I make my pet a new shell instead. A couple of shells, actually, and I let her choose one. She snuggles into her new home. Then I send out the machines to fabricate our new homes with silica paste, stationary shells that we will wear against this inhospitable planet. Perhaps one day we will trade these homes with each other, like hermit crabs when we feel constrained, and occupy a new floor plan or design. The designs fail. Chlorine winds eat holes in our buildings and blister our builders. We retreat into the confines of our rocket ship and watch our ghost town erode around us. The ruins disappear by nightfall, sparks arcing across the dunes. I extract silicon from the planet soil for my shells, red and purple hues to match the planet's dust. The hermit crabs inspect them, scrambling over forms I've designed to imitate the planet's geology with its whorls and curved foothills. The oldest one with crimson legs taps at a shell, tap, 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 and adopts it as his own. He looks up at me and I smile. The rocket frame groans around us as it shifts against the wind. Resources are dwindling and there's talk of forming an expedition. I measure time in hermit crab generations and shell manufacturing, refining my designs and composition. My pets are patient. They don't need to hear my voice and I have fallen silent in their presence. A couple of my crewmates joke about boiling and eating them, but they fall silent when I brandish my blaster at them. Tap, tap, tap. We think it's the wind, but we start seeing ghosts outside the portal windows. Dust wraiths form above the sparks, visible for a moment, 
before vanishing into the shadows. They tap at the door of our rocket ship at night, emitting no infrared signature for our scanners to capture. What are they? My crewmates ask me. What do they want? Come on, you're the closest thing we have to a biologist, you and your stinking pets. I shrug. I'm an architect of habitation units, not a biologist. Most of the biologists died en route. There are not many of us left. Tap, tap, tap. I have enhanced the hermit crab shells to be indestructible against the planet's environment with its chlorine winds and electrical storms. My beauties love their new homes and clamber to occupy the spaces I've designed for them. Their legs open and close like fingers on a fist before retreating into their shells to sleep. Tap, tap, tap. They're getting more aggressive. Not the hermit crabs, my little lovelies, but the things outside our rocket ship. And my crewmates have grown mad with misconceptions. They rage at the tapping, fantasize about violence, and pretend that we still have free will. <laughs> Our free will ended when we trapped our si ourselves inside this shell. I know how this ends. Tap. That's enough of this infernal knocking, the captain says. I'm going outside to confront these bastards. The things pull out his legs from under him. He shoots his blaster, but it flies off into the night as they drag him away. Tap. Our executioners stand outside the broken door of our rocket ship now, watching us and waiting. Tap, tap, tap echoes through the hull. We see them clearly for the first time, their black eyes pivoting among above segmented symmetry, their translucent bodies blending into the crimson dust. They reach inside to pull us out. Shoot them, you fool! My crewmates scream at me. I tend to my hermit crabs. They crawl over my hands and pinch my skin one last time before crouching back into their shells. I hope they will be cared for in my absence. Their artificial shells will survive far into the future. I have made sure of that. Their remains will adorn our ruins. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a joke. Yay! <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. Okay, what's scary comes out the sea with a bang and is found on the table on 25th December? A Christmas Kraken. Yes! <laughs> and it's my great pleasure to introduce the next um, speaker, reader, who is the brilliant Pippa Goldschmidt. Pippa is non-fiction editor here at Shoreline of Infinity. She writes fiction, which is awesome, and non-fiction inspired by science. She has had her work broadcast on BBC Radio 4 and most recently published in Magma, Art Review, Times Literary Supplement, BBC Sky at Night magazine, and New Writing Scotland. So please give a big hand for Pippa. Hi everyone. So the first thing I should say is that I am ridiculously overexcited to be here in real life at Event Horizon. I haven't been at a Shoreline event for years now, so this is just fantastic to sort of be here and see people and read and talk, so it's just lovely. Anyway, so I'm going to start off by reading uh, three of my own flash fictions. Two are new and one is quite old. Some of you might have heard it before, but I figured I might be able to get away with that. Um, and then I've got a much more important task of thanking Noel and Mark, but we'll come to that in a minute. So, what the theory worries about? The theory has just been discovered, which is marvellous and a cause for celebration. But the theory is anxious because it's been discovered by a woman and it knows, of course it knows, it's part of the eternal truth of the universe. 
that consequently it will be forgotten for quite a few years. The theory is about symmetry, about space. It's written in the language of cosmic time rather than human lifespans. So the theory can afford to hang around and get rediscovered at a later date. It's not urgent. But even so, the theory would quite like to be known now, to be lectured about to students, written up in textbooks, discussed at conferences, even be the subject of a Brian Cox documentary on BBC Two. The theory thinks that would be cool. The theory is confident that it can predict experimental data, the sort that needs really large and really expensive instruments buried underground or launched into outer space. But the theory knows that in order for that to happen, a lot of people need to believe the woman. But it also knows that only three people have read the paper about it written by the woman. And of these three, two didn't understand it, and they blamed her for this. The third person didn't understand it either, but at least he didn't blame her. <laughs> when the theory is rediscovered, it knows it will be required to pretend that it's brand new and do the same sort of ta-da revelation that it has already done once as it emerged from pages of mathematical symbols as it slipped out so nicely and logically because the woman had been working so hard. Week after week she worked on this theory while she attended departmental meetings and ignored her colleagues arguing about what colour to paint the common room and whom they should invite to give the annual guest lecture. The theory hopes that when it's rediscovered by a man, he should realise that it already exists, that it was written in that obscure paper he neglected to read. The theory would like it to be known right now that it wants to be named after the woman and not the man, and if there are any Nobel Prizes to be had, that the woman should be included. Thank you. <laughs> so the next one is very loosely inspired by the very first X-ray that was made by the German physicist Röntgen in 1895. And he famously took an X-ray of his wife's hand. And when she saw her own bones, her own skeleton, she said, I have seen my own death. It's called the expert in pain. Because her left hand hurts at odd moments of the day and night, she has been invited to the hospital where she tells the doctors that the pain starts when she is peeling potatoes or writing or just thinking without even moving her hands. She demonstrates to them how still she can be and yet suffer. They pick up her hand in theirs and press their own fingers against hers, wanting to find the pain or at least the answer to it hidden inside her. When did she first become aware of it, they ask. But who can ever know this? She tries to explain it has emerged gradually from a state of not pain, like a young girl finding out about the world. But her words don't help them understand, so they decide to take an x-ray. They position her hand flat on the metal plate before leaving the room, abandoning her to the beam of radiation. When the x-ray is displayed, the most definite feature is a horizontal strip across her ring finger. She has never worn a wedding ring. The doctors aren't surprised. It happens at random, they tell her, or maybe one in a thousand x-rays, although they can't yet predict it in advance. They're conducting a study of women's left hands so they can investigate this phenomenon in more detail. They insist on showing her hundreds of x-rays of hands all with the same black line at right angles to the finger bone, like a word on a page being crossed out. Before they tell her, they would be happy to include her x-ray in their study. Nobody has mentioned the pain for some time, and she realizes they've lost interest in it. So she says goodbye, puts her hand in a coat pocket to protect it from the world outside. So the next... Um, one is <laughs> clap for everyone. <laughs> Next one is even more loosely inspired by um, an encounter that I had with Peter Higgs, the guy who discovered or invented uh, the Higgs boson. 
And uh, I went up to Orkney to take part in the Orkney Science Festival. And when you do that, uh, it's great fun. You get, uh, you get accommodation uh, in Orkney um, from the organisers of the Science Festival. And I realised I found myself sharing a cottage with Peter Higgs. And one morning, I made him a piece of toast for breakfast, as you do. <laughs> So this was a very, very loose inspiration for this. <laughs> very loose. This is not Peter Higgs. A universal explanation of toast. I've always fancied myself as a particle physicist, and this morning when I enter the common room and smell toast, I know I'm going to have my first real scientific success. The institution's assistant is already sitting at the table, and without looking up from her open newspaper, she slides the little plastic cup of pills towards me like she does every morning. But I ignore this because I'm here to work. The smell indicates to me that a slice of bread has recently be been exposed to a short but intense burst of heat, in turn caused by electrical resistance in a current carrying wire grid. The bread surface correspondingly raised to the correct temperature for the melting of butter. But there's no plate on the table, and neither is there any crockery in the sink, or even cutlery, apart from a solitary teaspoon that, when I pick it up and hold it against the back of my hand, it emits a very slight warmth, like a small star destined to end its life by being locked away in a part of the galaxy too far from public, tra from public transport for any visitors to reach. Or... Now that I come to think of it, like the universe itself, as it continues cooling, is predicted by the second law of thermodynamics. From this, I can only assume that the assistant recently used the teaspoon to make herself a cup of tea and has since drunk it and hidden the mug from me. When I search in the bin for evidence of tea bags, she continues to read her newspaper, tracing each line of the codes that I've never been able to crack. An odour of sweet and citrus permeates the room, but I reject the presence of marmalade as superfluous to my deductions. I touch the surface of the table and find water. A damp table is one that has been wiped recently, and a table is wiped because it's dirty, and it's dirty because it's had crumbs scattered on this, and from this I deduce the existence of carbon produced by helium atoms, these atoms themselves being primordial and thus formed in the Big Bang. A slight asymmetry right at the time of the Big Bang, perhaps not dissimilar to a fault in someone's brain when they are born, has led to the universal dominance of matter over antimatter and the local, at least here in this institution, dominance of toast over anti-toast. <laughs> the assistant has nearly reached the bottom of the page and the end of her story, but I've got there before her. I've sold it, I say, but she still won't look up, so I'm forced to raise my voice. I can prove it all, the existence of molecules and atoms, quarks, leptons, bosons, and the origin of mass itself. And because she's always such a polite lady, she closes the newspaper, sighs quietly, and prepares to listen to me. So the last one is actually... <laughs> The last one is the title story in my collection, The Need for Better Regulation of Outer Space. And I'm pretty sure I've read it before at a previous event horizon, but that won't have been for several years. So you might not remember it. Or you might do. You might enjoy reading, listening to it again. Anyway. The GPS was the first clue, for us at least, that something had gone wrong. Day after day on the school run, it insisted we were somewhere else snarled up in traffic in Saigon, stuck outside a checkpoint in East Jerusalem, or battling our way through the waves to St Kilda. We took the GPS back to the shop, but they said there was a problem with all the satellites now, and they suggested an A to Z. That was the same day we tried to watch the cut match on Sky, but the pitch was covered in echoes of past games, all piled up on each other like pages torn out of an old book. Electric ghosts of players scored goals against themselves over and over again, at least until the TV burst into flames. They just couldn't cope with all that information. Then the satellites started crashing into each other, like celestial dodgings, and all the astronauts in the space stations were trapped, waiting for help that could never reach them. It got to the point where we could go and sit outside at night, 
reading our books by the light of the debris catching fire as it slammed around above our heads. Some of this debris was large enough to survive the atmosphere and reach us on the patio, and we wondered why it had been so important to launch a coffee cup or a pencil into outer space in the first place, and whether the astronauts had been a bit too ambitious in their choice of poetry anthologies. <laughs> and exactly how much the dead millionaire had paid to have his ashes launched into outer space, complete with a brass plaque engraved for all eternity. We could use the coffee cups, but the poetry was a bit charred around the edges and frankly second-rate stuff, so we went to Oxfam. <laughs> the ashes sit on the mantelpiece and glow as if they're being resurrected in heaven, and that's okay, but the body of an astronaut still strapped to its ejector seat was too much. It only just missed our greenhouse and made a crater in the lawn. And now there's no more night, and the skies turn to grey junk, so having our summer holiday in the living room we're pretending it's Glastonbury under the dining table, converted into a shelter in case any more debris rains down. Okay. So. so now the important bits. So I just want to say a few words about Noel and Mark. This is like the sort of big thank you part of the evening. Um, and we've got, uh, we've got a couple... Uh, gifts to hand over to them just to sort of prepare yourself guys <clears throat> so I just want to sort of remind you about what Noel and Mark have, have achieved over the past few years and when they started Shoreline quite a long time ago now back in, t in autumn 2014 sort of uh, which feels like another lifetime ago doesn't it you know before Brexit before Covid you know and perhaps uh, uh, sort of round about the time of the, of the, of the referendum and so on Anyway, their aim was to publish science fiction that looked at the big questions that was based in Scotland but had an international perspective. And so early is issues were already publishing work by Ken McLeod, sitting here tonight, <laughs> and uh, other luminaries like Duncan Lunan, Andrew J. Wilson is also here, <laughs> Tracy Rosenberg and Ruth Aylett and Tim Major and Jane Yolan. And they also um, shone a light on perhaps some unfairly forgotten work by Scottish authors in the past in the SF Caledonia column. So they were, reminded us about authors like Naomi Mitchison and David Lindsay. And as soon as it started, Shoreline started being successful in that many authors and artists started winning or being shortlisted for awards by British Science Fiction Association and the British Fantasy Society and uh, writers such as Ruth Booth, Toby Agundarin, Zen Sho, and uh, artists such as Jackie Duckworth were all shortlisted and won awards. And the magazine as a whole won the Science, uh, British Fantasy Society Award in 2018. And we also got awarded money by Creative Scotland in 2019 and again in 2021. And this was really important because it allowed us to start to pay our contributors and performers. <clears throat> and but I think the important thing about Shoreline um, is that they, Noel and Mark always had a vision about their making the magazine inclusive and attracting readers and writers and artists who might not be able to see themselves, to find themselves in science fiction, who were historically underrepresented. So there have been special issues with the guest editors, at least one of whom's here, Tendai Huchu, uh, who've uh, featured work by black and people of colour, black writers and people of colour, women. I was one of the guest editors for one of the special issues for, the, for women writers. LGBTQ plus and neurodivergent authors and artists. And these, yeah, there is. <laughs> Again, special authors, special editors. <laughs> yeah, also Joe Ross Barrett. <laughs> And I think these are really important issues because they work fantastically well and increasing diversity in the shoreline community. <clears throat> but it's not just a magazine, of course. Uh, we're standing here tonight, we're all at Event Horizon, and Event Horizon has been going now for several years, sort of uh, uh, supported, sort of worked out by Ro Russell and his terrible jokes. And, um, and I think it's now... <laughs> It's now more than 70 live and online events, and the fact that uh, you managed to keep it going during lockdown was just uh, incredible. And Shoreline has worked really well with other groups and communities, other publishers and academics, 
such as Chimera, uh, the Edinburgh Book Festival, um, the Social Dimensions of Outer Space Group, the Center for Science and Imagination at Arizona State University, and Luna Press, also based here in Edinburgh. <clears throat> and of course, we have to mention not just the magazine, but the magazine, one of uh, Noel's and Mark's fantastic ideas. You don't just get a mug, you get a story and a beautifully illust uh, beautiful illustration on the mug. And of course, a full-length musical drama, Seeing Stars. <laughs> And the magazine has been so supportive of writers, not just here in Scotland, but all over the world. And it's really fostered the community in real life and online. And it's been successful in doing this because of Noel's and Mark's supportive and nurturing abilities, the way they really care for and work with writers and artists, and their ability to persuade people to take part, to create, to join up. And I've met Noel for countless coffees over the years in the National Library, and whenever I meet up, we always sit for hours thinking up ideas for all sorts of creative projects. And I always somehow end up with this sort of to-do list as long as my arm. <laughs> and I think that's real testament to their ability to sort of gently persuade, to encourage, to support uh, people to go sort of slightly beyond what you think you're capable of, perhaps what you think you've got time for, but then nevertheless, you feel inspired by them. <clears throat> So it's really these sort of behind the scenes abilities that make Mark and Noel such brilliant people to work with. And the fact that there's now a whole team of people, a whole team of us sort of uh, ready and willing to take forward Shoreline is testament to their abilities. I know that uh, when they step down as editors in chief, they're gonna continue to be involved in a whole myriad of creative projects. I know they've got all sorts of plans for uh, <laughs> albums, books, etc. And I can't wait to see what they produce in the future. But for now, I'd like you to uh, invite you all to give it up to Noel and Mark and invite them down to stage. <laughs> we have gifts. <laughs> we have beautifully, beautifully designed gifts. Okay. So I'm going to ask Mark to say a few words now, and then Noel, you'll have your moment of glory later. <laughs> so I'm just going to introduce Mark yet again. In case you didn't know, Mark is the arts director, one of the founders. He's not only been a huge influence on Shoreline of, on of Infinity's content, design and direction, but he's commissioned artwork for the magazine and put on gallery exhibitions, which have promoted the work of sci-fi artists in Scotland, as well as the great beyond. Holyrood. 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 <laughs> Scottish Parliament, yeah. <laughs> so we're all going to be really sad to see Mark go, but we're wishing him best on his next journey. And you want to say a few words now, Mark? So... I'll give it up to Mark. Thank you very much, Pippa, and thank you to the rest of the team. I'll have a good look at all this later, but there seems to be a very nice thing that will decorate our walls. Very good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think Pippa's told most of the story of how we, we got going. Um, basically, Noel and I were walking Noel's dog in about a week or two after the independence referendum. But we'd been, been kind of busy during that time, and we thought, well, what are we going to do next? And uh, we thought, well, uh, okay, we didn't get independence, but what does Scotland really need? And uh, immediately the answer was obviously the science fiction magazine, because <laughs> it didn't have one. So uh, uh, Noel has a lot of, had a lot of um, history with making fanzines and stuff like that in the past, so he thought, well, I can take over the, the words. And I thought, well, I, I'm a comic artist, I do that sort of thing, so I'll do something with the art. And the, it sort of grew, and then we ran into Russell, and it kind of took off. Because uh, the other thing is, Russell was very early, and, and it's a kind of a triumvirate. Um, the reason why there's a wee community here that supports this magazine, because I mean, the magazine's not the big success, it's, it's these things. <laughs> and uh, this was, this was uh, Russell saying, well, you've got a magazine out, you're going to launch it. Uh, because being a poet, that's what poets do, they launch things all the time. So, uh, so we ended up at uh, one of the bars just oh. off of... Uh, oh. Paradise Palms, that's what it was. 
and they, we said, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to launch it? Uh, well, we're going to have readings from it, but we need a band. So, of course, Noel and I <laughs> to have a band. So, uh, so uh, that became a feature for a while until, of course, w Russell wisely banned us from that. <laughs> but the, um, the, the thing is, um, Showline of Infinity is the third of a, a series. There's Portraits in Stone, there's a Stone Hill on the Shore, and then there was On the Shoreline of Infinity, the third album. If you look up Arbolos and Painted Ocean on Bandcamp, you'll find those first two albums, and the third one's not there yet. This was supposed to be the third album, and it's, I mean, how many years is that? That's, that's longer than any of the rest of them. So we might go and do the third album properly, <laughs> well, or, you know, the way we would do it. Uh, so there might be another, another incarnation of this thing. So lots of things that we might go on to, um, but basically we just like to tell stories, so that's why we've got these things going. And we tell, like to tell stories with various different media, which is why it's been great to discover, when we, I didn't know there was science fiction poetry before we started this. And then all these other things started to happen. We've got uh, actors, we've got we've bands, we've got all sorts of things. We have people that um, perform music of, from the art. We've you know, also, all sorts of things spin on, spin on from that. And the nice thing is, this is about the first thing that Noel and I, we create lots of things because we have this thing where Noel will say, it wouldn't be great if something happened and then I'll say, oh yeah, we definitely have to do that. And I kind of egg him on and get him busy with stuff. So he does most of the work. I just kind of encourage him. And uh, uh, But see, it's nice. This, this is the first one we've actually been able to hand something on to another generation to carry it forward. So it looks like there's a future for this one, which is great. Uh, which means that we can start making stuff and submitting and trying to get ourselves published in the magazine <laughs> then as well. So we'll see, see what happens with that. We may have to use pseudonyms. Uh, but there's lots of things ahead. Uh, we're, we're going to keep creating stuff. Um, I just want to mention we have the Cthulhu brothers sitting at the back here who have performed at the event horizon before. And they basically come, they've come to take us away and make us do some music at some point. So uh, that's definitely going to happen. And there'll be stories, there'll be art, there'll be all that thing. But thanks very much to everybody who's supported this over the years and just this amazing community that's come out of nowhere. You know, just who would have known? <laughs> Just walking a dog and suddenly you, you got this. Um, so, so thanks very much for all the support you've had. And please continue to support the team uh, because they've been doing this for quite a while now. It's just it took us a while to you know, persuade them that, you know what, you don't really need us to carry on because you guys are doing it. And uh, so they're, they're doing it. And the next issue, we'll see what that looks like. As the Beachcomber said, it's a farewell to Kings because we're going to do some music now. <laughs> the next thing. Uh, but uh, it's... A, new, a whole new team. It's a much more cooperative team effort now, so that's, that's great. So I'll hand it over to them, and they hopefully we'll see another one of these doing something else some other time. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Keep it going for Mark and Noel. We're going to be hearing from Noel later, uh, but thanks, Mark, for uh, those words, and obviously for everything, really. Uh, before we have a break, um, and then we're going to hear a couple more readings, and we'll hear from, from Noel. Uh, I need to show you the final raffle prize. An even bigger bag. <laughs> These are definitely are not left over from last Christmas, by the way. <laughs> this is sci-fi themed. So we got some space stickers. Some... Uh, Milky Way Universe, yes. Haribo Star Mix, There's loads of stuff. Issue One of Shoreline of Infinity, a collector's item. If you're lucky, you could ask Mark and Noel to sign it, and it'll be worth at least two pounds on eBay. <laughs> at least, I say. <laughs> uh, some Marvel playing cards. And uh, the big prize here is um, the artwork from issue one as a print. Yes. Very nice indeed. Oh, there's also Charlie and the Chocolate Factory on DVD. But I, that got a bit lost in there. <laughs> and also, the artist is here tonight. Scribble Imp is over here. So um, if you win, please do go in uh, a scrap to scrap. Chat to Scribble Imp about the artwork. It's an amazing artwork. Okay, so uh, we're going to have a break now. 
uh, for about 15 minutes. And during the break, we're going to play some Painted Ocean music so you can listen to that and um, drown your sorrows. <laughs> See you in 15. <laughs> The flakes falling on your tongue Your walk beside me Is more than I deserve More than I deserve Slow down, take it easy Take your time, there's no hurry around, enjoy what you have, sometimes you have to let go, watch the world from your window, Christmas is a good time to take a new path, to take a new The daft days are the days between Christmas and Hogmanay. Let's take a walk to look back and before. With the blue sky above and the white hills beneath our feet, our worries dissolve with the turn of the door. With the turn of the door Slow down, take it easy Take your time, there's no hurry Stop, look around Enjoy what you have Sometimes you have to let go Watch the world from your window Christmas is a good time To take a new path To take a new Santa can't leave you presents forever. Switch off your screens, step away from your car, my friend. Put down your phone, take the words from your ears. Your slavery. Let's cast off our toys, raise a glass and sing cheers. Raise a glass and sing cheers. <laughs> Slow down, take it easy. Take your time, there's no hurry. Stop, look around, enjoy what you have. Sometimes you have to let go, watch the world from your window. 
Christmas is a good time to take a new path. To take a new path. that you feel is the breath of the earth. Catch the air cold and crisp, taste the flakes falling on your tongue. Your warmth beside me is more than I deserve, more than I deserve.
Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to start back up again, so I'm going to give you a 30-second a, a countdown. Well, I'm not actually. I'm going to just stand here for 30 seconds. Well, you please take your seats if possible. Thank you. That's right. Have a lovely seat. Well, I hope you had a lovely break and uh, drowned those sorrows of uh, our founders leaving. Um, but we're back with some more performances, more readings. And, um, and then at the end, we're going to hear from Noel and draw the raffle, of course. So uh, it's a great pleasure to tell a joke. You'll like this one. You'll like this one, right? Why is Doctor Who concerned about seasoning the Christmas turkey this year? He's worried about the end of time. Thank you. You love it. You can tell on Christmas Day, you sat around the table. Feel free to share it with your, your friends and family. I just saw actually today that the um, Doctor Who exhibition is opening at the National uh, Museum. So that looks cool. And we missed the Cybermen. I only saw it at this evening. The Cybermen were there for half an hour. Anyway, a <laughs> uh, great pleasure to introduce Ken McLeod, who's a brilliant friend of Shoreline. Uh, Ken lives in Gurk on the west coast of Scotland. He has degrees in biological sciences, worked in IT, and is now a full-time writer. He's the author of 18 novels from The Star Fraction in 1995 to Beyond the Hallowed Sky in 2021, and many articles and short stories, and Ken is immensely chuffed that some of them have appeared in Shoreline of Infinity. So please welcome Ken McLeod. Uh, thank you, Russell, and thank you all. This story that I'm going to read, a short story, it doesn't quite manage to be flash fiction because it's, I think, 1,005 words long, <laughs> was <coughs> published as part of this collection a few years ago, uh, Particulates, and it was a collection of stories inspired by an artwork, an art installation, no, no less, which involved, as I understand it, a very large circular room with green laser lights forming patterns around it. And it was obviously vastly more impressive than I'm describing now. And <laughs> it inspired this little short story. The Earthman Prophecies. January 12th, 2018. 57 degrees Fahrenheit, 100% humidity outside. 56 degrees Fahrenheit, 99% humidity inside. That's just the art installation, sorry. The Earthman Prophecies. On the bus to the proving ground, the phone buzzes in my pocket. Hello, I say. Is that me? The voice sounds familiar, but I can't place it. What? Oh, right, it's you. Are you on the bus? I press the phone to my ear, struggling to hear above passenger conversation, engine noise, tire hiss, and wiper. Womp, womp. Yes, I say, who's this? Me, he says. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. What? I say again. You'll see, he chuckles annoyingly and hangs up. Prank call? Last night, my landline rang about 10.30. No one spoke. Then I answered. Today's entry in my Google calendar says, the year is 2018 and we're going to the stars. I never wrote that. Our aim is a little less ambitious. We're creating plasmas with directed lasers and focused electron beams. We hope our research will contribute to fusion power, but that's a long way down the line. The team has an in-joke, it's true. Between ourselves, we call the apparatus 
the spin dizzy after the faster than light drive in James Blish's classic Cities in Flight novels, in which 2018 is the year of the first interstellar flight. Back in the 1950s, this may have seemed plausible. <laughs> the proving ground is in the no man's land between the campus and the derelict port. We've repurposed a grain silo, 30 meters high, still dusty, and the roof leaks, but the space inside made an adequate laboratory once we'd host the clustered pigeon droppings off the floor. I'm late. Clarkson is underneath the five meter wide circular platform, adjusting and oiling the bearings. Saad paces around the perimeter, checking the lasers one by one. She spares me a nod. Clarkson emerges, wiping his hands. Saad steps back. All set? Yeah, and good morning to you too, she says. She's giving me a puzzled look. Clarkson laughs. Good morning, I say with a shrug. I know I can be awkward. No need to rub it in. You just here, Saad asks. Yes, I say. The bus was slow this morning. She frowns. I thought I saw you outside here half an hour ago, just before I got off the bus. I shake my head, but something's bothering me. Oh, well, says Saad. It was raining and still dark, so... She spreads her hands. I stride over to the control pedestal. Its instrument label still refer to the turbine it originally served. Wires shunt into the port of an iPad, where the readings will be displayed. This contraption is almost as jerry-rigged as the rotating platform, which we retrieved from a bankrupt truck garage. Twelve electron beam diodes, matched by a dozen photoelectric sensors, are set 10 metres up all around the walls. Right now, of course, the readings are blank. OK, I say, powering up. Saad and Clarkson retreat behind the two-inch thick scuffed perspex of the safety screen. I click the main power switch to its first position. The platform jitters and then begins to rotate smoothly. I switch on the lasers around the perimeter. Sixty needle-thin beams shine out. Angled sideways and inward, they converge ten metres above the platform. In the dust and the drops of falling water, they're clearly visible, forming two twisted cones joined at their tips. Another switch powers up the electron beams, which aren't visible but meet at the same place as the lasers. The point of the beam's intersection pops into view as a glowing phosphor dot on the iPad. Readings from the sensor scroll up in a column alongside. I fine-tune the beams and increase the speed of rotation. The platform's vibration can be felt through the concrete floor and the control panel. On this test, the 17th, we're spinning faster than ever before. And just as we expected, the plasma forms. The dot on the screen now has a counterpart in reality a tiny, fiercely glowing sphere. The lines of laser light are now a blur. I take the spin higher. The plasma ball glows brighter and expands. The vibration through the floor stops, but I can still feel it through the heels of my palms on the control panel. Puzzled, I glance down. My feet are off the floor. A moment later, the panel itself is out of reach. I make a panicked grab for it and miss. I'm floating, quite inarguably. Saad and Clarkson are yelling. I look up and see the plasma ball become a ring, which opens out, descends, and passes around me like a hoop. I crash to the floor and just manage to land on my feet, off balance, stumbling. The room is silent and dark. Saad! Clarkson! Anyone there? Are you all right? No reply. I stay, where I, I stay where I am until my eyes adjust. There's a line of dim light a dozen meters away, which I guess is from under the door. I'm about to grope towards it when I remember my phone. In the glare of the torch app, I discover that nobody's around. 
and the equipment is all powered off. I boot up the iPad. The time is 10.17 p.m. I'm shocked at the time and check my watch. 09.15 a.m. Then I notice the day and date in the field. In the iPad, it's yesterday. Bewildered, I make my way out, wincing at a pain in my knee. No one is about. I call my flat. Hello, says a voice. This time I recognize it. I ring off. I find a warm corner in the laundry room of a student block, poke around on my Google calendar and crash out. I wake up, bleary, sometime before nine. My watch is over ten hours behind, but I can guess from the surrounding sounds. There's a payphone in the lobby. I switch off my phone and call its number. Hello? Is that me? I ask. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. I stroll to the proving ground in no rush. It's 2018. We're going to the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, Russell has asked me to read a joke. <laughs> one, three, two, one, three. No, that's my raffle ticket. Sorry. <laughs> the joke. Why did Han Solo not eat all of his Christmas Wookiee? Because it was chewy. Oh. Oh. Don't, don't thank me, folks. The perpetrator of that joke is about to come on. <laughs> Russell Jones is the poetry editor and events organizer at Shoreline of Infinity. He has been part of the editorial team since issue one, and as a writer has published six poetry collections, three novels, and a graphic novel. He was the world's first pet poet laureate, has a PhD in creative writing, and is a master comedian of world renown, <laughs> having written tonight's jokes. Thank you. That was very kind of you, Ken, to say that about my jokes. Thank you. I actually wrote that bio. Uh, I'm just going to read a few poems tonight um, from an old collection and a slightly newer one. <clears throat> this one's called Blue Planet. Thinking futuristic, I see a flash in the starlight. Green, perhaps Jupiter on a vacation from invisibility. No. It expands in a curious mangle like no simplistic hunk of rock, a species gazing downward on a strange blue planet. I wonder what they translate from that distance, if they saw us like a gemstone laid out on a pitch velvet display. On earth, we are the mine, the miner, pickaxe and cutter, expert, Assessor, we are the jewelers. That emerald glow might sweep us up like a grainy imperfection on the immaculate night, recalling when we're long gone how our waves swerved and our apes walked upright. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Ken and I were trying to remember where we met all that time ago. I think it was about 10 years ago, maybe. Um, and I recalled it was, the, the, I think, at the Genomics Forum, which he was judging a poetry competition. And this is the poem that I submitted to that competition. I only got him second, though, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you. It's OK. Chromosome medley. 2052. Choices for the unconceived. Baby blue or baby brown as Bombay mix, bark, a chest of drawers. What's hereditary? Remove the walrus from the walrus. 
your mother's snout needn't be yours. Here, take this flawless mandible, push the outy inny, avoid that fleshy, cankerous, cancerous brick gifted by daddy. Who said God? Every choice made for us is every choice made for us. 1984, one case example. Dad shaves, showers in cologne, doesn't comb his hair for fashion. Mum shaves, washes her hair, detonates her eyelashes. Dad drives, drinks, walks, jokes, uses his one chat-up line on complexion. Mum walks, drinks, sings, smokes, eyes, trousers her way to conception. 0008, the human race. Tong quick, word quick, spermatozoa quick, a thousand generations bang their head on a charged urethra. Carry the messages of ancestry, little single cell. Carry the burden and the brilliance of homo sapientry. And plant it deep as the corpses, wide as the world. A light of life flickers like a first word. Two caveats merge. Two eyes pieced together under the auditorium. Darkness cannot determine the bright mind, but the dull sound, thrump, thrump of war drums, the gentle burn of morning song can. And food is what feeds, a yearning for crushed grass, charcoal, daisy petals, a hen's carcass, peas. There aren't always choices, but there are always decisions. The baby won't be born with a book, but it may still read. The blue eye may be clearer than the brown, but both will see. Thank you. <clears throat> and from a newer collection called uh, Dark Matters, I forgot what it was called, uh, obviously, we're all screwed because of the planet being destroyed, essentially, and particularly with the bees going out. So I had the idea of what if we could build robot bees, and then I believe that's appeared on television since then, and I came up with the idea, basically. <laughs> um, and this one's called Waggle Dancers. Who knew how the apple was made? We decrypted rumors, white whiskers of truth from the textbooks of the day. Some things were certain. We'd no orchards, no farms, no vineyards or everglades, just buzzing recollections from kaput hollow tapes. So we placed our faith in technology, trusted the data. We built solar wings, hives of nano replica apis to seek and recover. Now they swarm space. We hope they fly safe in their waggle dance through distant galaxies. We're the workers, tracking signals we don't know the tail end of. We need a cachet, a golden seed of DNA to name our savior. We've no gods anymore, but we pray the bees will return. Save us from our self-made endless drift, our fruitless catastrophe. Thank you. And just one more, um, I mentioned Doctor Who earlier, so there's a Doctor Who poem, it's a, a sonnet. <clears throat> you might recognise that I've kind of, not stolen, um, <laughs> borrowed, yeah, you know, you know what I'm, mean. inspired by another famous poem. To his coy Dalek. <laughs> Had we but worlds enough and time to reconvene beneath the whirling stars, to set our pasts, our tools aside, and dream as aging lovers might. Our mutual scars might wither in the dying light. We could see our universal love for what it is. Something of you informs something of me. Though we stutter at each step, we must address our differences, not plunge through darkness, gripe, and vex, suggest extermination to cure our temporal misery. Who knows in which dimensions we might acquiesce? Let's try them all 
deny expectations. Darling, my two hearts beat because of you. Thank you. Uh, and that's it for the readings, but we do, of course, have the very important, not task, it pleasure, of um, hearing from Noel Chidwick. And I'm going to introduce Noel, <laughs> because some of you may not know who he is. I, I would have thought you probably do. Um, but I also, of course, I've worked with Noel for a long time, so I'll say a little bit. Uh, our final words tonight, before the raffle and the thanks, are from Sean Infinity's editor-in-chief, Noel Chidwick. You've already heard about Noel from Pippa earlier, but suffice to say he's been the keystone in bringing Shoreline Infinity and its various books, events, and other projects to sci-fi audiences in Scotland and the known universe. For almost a decade, Noel, we've been doing it. Uh, he'd like to say a few words to you all, um, and obviously I would like to say thank you to Noel and to Mark for everything they've done, uh, but please welcome Noel to the stage. Well, uh, what an amazing evening. Thank you very much, everyone, for all turning up and uh, this little little shindig. I have no idea what I'm going to say, so I'll probably ramble uh, randomly, so I'll try and keep it short. What I would say, though, it's been one hell of a journey, hasn't it? Uh, eight, eight years ago it was when we first came up with the idea of Shoreline, as, as Mark so eloquently told you earlier on. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat what Mark said. He did it, said it so well. That's been brilliant. But this journey started off with a simple idea of, of seeing we could produce a science fiction magazine. And we had no idea it was going to lead to this. We had no idea at all. It's been a wonderful journey. But for me, one of the most important and beautiful things that's happened is how I've met so many wonderfully brilliant, creative people and talented people in this science fiction world. And we've all gathered together and Shoreline's become a kind of a focal point and a gathering place, which... Uh, I don't think we could really see before we, we, we started this, so it's been a great privilege to do that. And that's where we are just now. And in this mad world we're living in, uh, Russ has already pointed out that we're, this planet's kind of doomed, unless we do something drastic about it quickly. Uh, that's where sh uh, Shoreline and, and science fiction can come in. Science fiction is a great medium for taking ideas, exploring them madly, and seeing how they work. And most of science and technology is has evolved from science fiction. Star Trek became reality with the, with the space shuttle Enterprise. The, the ideas are there. And if you read any issue of Shoreline, there's a dozen stories of the moral. And each one, there's a little kernel of an idea that may or may not help. Or at the very least, when you're reading these stories, like my 17-year-old self did many, many years ago, you, you can go away to a different world. And just for a few minutes, you're in a wonderful place where everything is, seems good and wonderful and everything could happen. And science fiction gives you that power. So all you science fiction writers out there, keep writing. You're inspiring the next generation. And I'm glad to say the next generation of Shoreline Infinity will continue under this wonderful team, which I'm so pleased when they announced to me one, one evening over Zoom that they were going to do this. And I, a little tear did come to my eye. And um, I'm really, really pleased above all else that that's happening. So... I hope you will give the new Shoreline Infinity uh, encouragement and support as you've given us so far with it. So, but thank you all very much for reading it, uh, writing for it, and supporting it. It's all appreciated. So, thank you very, very much. Let's do once more for Noel Chidwick, please. That's eight years hard work. And uh, we wouldn't be here now if it weren't for him and Mark. And um, also, it's meant to be his night off, but I've put him on the tech booth as well. <laughs> so thanks for that, Noel. <laughs> uh, so it's time to draw the raffle. So get your tickets ready. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, James to, to draw the tickets and shout at me, if that's okay. Uh, so the first one is going to be for the Christmas bag. Uh, the decapitated Rudolph, the joke book, the, the mug and the Rudolph film and all of that. So, James? 116. 116. Hey, well done. We 
We have to do a drum roll before we do the number as well, because that's, that's the. This is for the uh, Chris, the Santa bag, and the winner is one five seven. Who is it? Hey! I'm glad you won. Well done. Um, and the last bag is the Shoreline Infinity sci-fi bag. It includes the first issue and the original artwork. And the winner is... 148. Who is it? So at the very back. Oh, it's a Cthulhu brother. Well done to all the winners. Yay. If you didn't win this time, maybe next time. So you have to come back. Um, so all that's left is to say a few thanks. So I'm going to do them all, and then um, and then we'll, I'll ask you to applaud. Uh, <laughs> so to everyone behind the scenes, which is the staff at the Pleasant Cabaret Bar, Shore Infinity team, which includes James and Yasmin, who are on the merch table, to Sandy at Channel 7A for live streaming, Creative Scotland for funding, to University of Edinburgh, uh, sorry, to Napier University students. <laughs> For judging our flash fiction competition. In fact, let's let's thank all of them right now. And <laughs> uh, next up uh, for our performers and readers, who are Eris Young, me, Debbie Cannon, Ken McLeod, Pippa Goldschmidt, and Painted Ocean. Uh, to all of you, without you, the Shoreline team would be at home crying as our founders sail off into the Shoreline <laughs> Infinity. And the biggest one, of course, so we've got to really raise the roof on this one. Our founders, Noel and Mark, for everything they've done for science fiction, uh, for all the readers and writers in Scotland and beyond, let's wish them all the best on their next voyage into the great unknown. We're going to be back in 2023. It's going to be a much better year. I've, I know it. Um, so keep watching our social media and have a great festive break. We'll see you then. Bye. Show.